While traditionally I haven't been the biggest fan of AMD CPUs for a variety of reasons, I have to say that the upcoming Ryzen 7000 series has me more interested now than ever before. Alright, so what am I talking about for those of you who may not be up to date on what's been going on? At Computex 2022, AMD announced their X670 MB650 chipset motherboards, featuring the AM5 socket, DDR5, and PCI 5.0 and 4.0 support respectively. What's more interesting than the boards though is the chips that socket into them, and this announcement was a massive lurch forward towards the unveiling and release of the highly anticipated Ryzen 7000 series. From what AMD has said, and shown publicly, we know a lot more about them now than we did six months ago. I wanted to discuss some of the aspects of the release that have me looking forward to it, and collect some of the information that AMD has said in their marketing materials, during presentations, and to the media. The first hardware spec that we have a general idea about is clock speeds. From what AMD showed at Computex this year, we know that at least 8 cores in the 7000 series chips can hit 5.5 GHz stable. They also were clear that this demo was on an engineering sample, which could mean that clocks will be higher on final release hardware, or that clocks will stabilize around here on some models. Now increasing clock speeds is way easier of a thing to market than some abstract value such as IPC. We'll discuss the general IPC of these chips later in the video, but for now let's assume that there is no IPC improvement over Zen 3 based parts. Just bumping the all-core clocks to 5.5 GHz would provide a massive improvement in almost all workloads. You would see this sort of thing with Intel's TikTok model, where they released a microarchitecture, then the next chips would be a die shrink and clock bump of the same microarchitecture. I'm not saying that these chips are only a die shrink, but even if they were, they would still mean a massive performance improvement. Clocks are so vital for performance because it literally increases the amount of instructions your CPU is able to process per given period of time. Intel figured this out back in the Coffee Lake R days, and is why they are progressively bumping up clocks on their higher end chips. Let's say you have a single core processor that can process a single instruction per clock cycle. Let's say this chip also operates at a million clock cycles per second, or 1 megahertz. For every second, your CPU is able to process 1 million instructions. Now if you bump your clock speed up by 20%, up to 1.2 MHz, the amount of instructions you're able to carry out also increases by 20%. This is all in a perfect world, but in modern CPUs it's still a pretty strong correlation, and is multiplied in the billions of hertz and with tens of instructions per clock. Will every chip in the 7000 series clock to 5.5 GHz? Probably not. But with AMD officially marketing the entire Ryzen 7000 X chips as quote 5 plus gigahertz max boost clock capable, I think it hints that these high clock optimizations will probably be dripping down to the mid-range models. I could imagine an excellent 6 core 5 gigahertz chip coming from AMD being a massive hit, especially because it's kind of satisfying for PC geeks to see the once elusive 5000 megahertz on their MSI Afterburner overlay. These high clocks in the case of Zen 4 chips will drastically improve single-threaded performance, especially when combined with the architectural improvements. This upcoming feature alone could probably propel just Zen 3 to Alder Lake P-Core performance, but there is a slight difference in the hardware that I think is important to discuss. Besides clocks, another important change that's been made is adjustments to the execution port count and operations, cache layout, and instruction support. Right off the bat, the instruction set that I think most people are familiar with is AVX512, and with the update to Zen 4 comes support for set instruction set. While this probably won't be a full implementation, it should be at least AVX512 foundation, and if the AI accelerator part of their postings is true, it probably also includes the AVX512 VNNI and BFloat16 extensions. For programmers this will probably be a nice little inclusion, but for gamers this honestly won't help that much. What will help is a doubling of L2 cache, bringing the private per core size up to 1 megabyte. L3 cache appears to be similar to the Zen 3 configuration of 32 megabytes per chiplet, but the load store unit total amount appears to have increased as well. 
with AMD and several sources simply claiming improved cache, load, and write, as well as improvements to the circuitry responsible for prefetching data to the actual ALUs, with AMD and sources once again saying improved prefetch from and to register. Cache itself is what's speeding up performance significantly for each core. Increasing cache allows the CPU to store the data it's going to process or already processed in a place that's physically close to the ALU and CPU core itself. DRAM, while fast, has a latency that's inherent due to it being on an external board and integrated circuit. Instead of the CPU core just fetching data from its local cache, it has to communicate with another part of the chip that's physically further from the core than the cache is. That part of the chip, being a memory controller, then has to fetch the data from DRAM, which has latency of potentially hundreds of clock cycles. Once the memory controller has the data, it can then direct it to where it was being requested. Cache operates as a lower latency SRAM middleman between the ALU's registers and DRAM. Larger caches, while generally seen as good, also increase in latency as the size increases. That being said, a delay of 30 clock cycles is far better than 200 clock cycles, which is why even though the latency on the L3 cache and the 3D V cache parts from AMD is kind of high, it still improves performance significantly. Overall, for the actual data processing bits of the new CPU, the largest changes are going on with the caches and overall data retrieval circuitry, which while not being as exciting as a raw core count increase, still provides seemingly decent performance uplifts on their own. The third specification that we are 100% sure of is the connectivity and memory system. The memory controllers that are integrated into the I.O. die should amount to proper quad-dim dual-channel support for DDR5. The current memory controller from Intel has both a DDR4 and DDR5 mode, but when running any sort of XMP, the DDR5 mode is kind of questionable and sometimes won't even boot. I hope that AMD has figured out a way to make turning on XMP for DDR5 viable. And from the data they have released, the Ryzen 9 seem to clock up to around 5200 megatransfers per second without issue. This should increase bandwidth to the CPU while maintaining raw timing similar to DDR4. Density will also increase on DDR5 DIMMs as the technology matures, but right now it's significantly more expensive than DDR4 gigabyte for gigabyte, potentially turning this awesome incoming feature into a massive downside. The initial setup cost for AM5 with only DDR5 support will be higher than LGA1700, which continues to support the inexpensive and still very adequate older memory standard. However, one advantage that the new Ryzen 7000 series chips have over Alder Lake and the upcoming Raptor Lake is the number and generation of PCIe lanes. For those of you familiar with Intel's platform, they've been offering 20 PCIe lanes since their 11th gen chips. But on Alder Lake, this was split into 16 Gen 5.0 and 4 Gen 4.0 lanes, which means you get the new and improved standard for GPUs, none of which currently support PCIe 5.0, and then your NVMe drive gets the rest at a slower speed. AMD's platform won't have this issue as the CPUs will come with 24 PCIe Gen 5.0 lanes directly off the chips, setting you up for Gen 5 capable NVMe SSDs. The actual compatibility between these things is dependent mostly on the motherboard you choose, but the upcoming Ryzen 7000 series has the full capability to try full Gen 5.0 PCIe and NVMe. All in all, I am looking forward to AMD's Ryzen 7000 series. Not that I'm looking to buy one, but more so that I'm interested to see what they can bring to the table when it comes to performance. Recently the pricings for the chips leaked via a Canadian retailer, and things aren't looking particularly great. I think a lot of people were hoping for a price cut, especially on the Ryzen 5s, and I'm not gonna lie, I was in there with them. But it looks like we're actually going to see another price bump. I really hope that this whole situation is just being mislabeled and those prices aren't meant for the public, but they line up to be at least 10% over or nearly the same as the Ryzen 5000 series MSRPs. This combined with the high cost of DDR5, could potentially delay adoption of the entire platform, especially given AM4 is still very strong in value. On the flip side though, given AMD's past long-term socket support, buying into AM5 might be worth considering if you only want to upgrade your CPU every few years and not have to throw out the entire motherboard. 
This also means that buying into AM5 once DDR5 prices have come down and the tech has matured a little will probably be around the same price as adopting AM4 as it currently is. The only thing we can do now is wait for the reviews in a month or two. I know I for one will be eyeing these reviews just out of sheer curiosity. So thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed don't forget to leave a like and subscribe, and click the bell icon so you'll be notified about all our future uploads. I'm honestly looking forward to these chips, and I hope part of this video got you to start looking forward to these chips release. That's all I really have to say, so thanks again for watching, and I'll catch you in the next video.